Let me record. Okay, does the recording work? Because I also don't get the announcement. Uh, I got some announcement that recording Perfect. can be called, so I think. Okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, we're very happy to have Lorenz Eberhardt from the IAS, who will tell us about the perturbative CFT dual for pure and SNS ADS3 strings. Take it away, Lorenz. Okay, thank you very much for the very kind invitation. It's great to be back in Paris, even though slightly virtually. And so today I'll talk about a paper I wrote in the fall, but I should also mention that uh, this paper built upon lots of uh, related work, uh, mainly with Andrea uh, Day and also earlier with Matthias Gabadi. And uh, so I was asked to give a sort of general introduction, so I will also start very slowly and then sort of work my way towards the, the problem of interest. So let me start with some a little bit general introduction to ADS3 CFT2 holography. So um, ADS3 backgrounds can be engineered in string theory uh, using D1 and D5 brains. And uh, for example, we can uh, wrap D5 brains on a four torus. And so that will make up four dimensions of the D5. And then on the remaining two directions, we also put D1 brains. And uh, if we go to the near horizon limit of this configuration, then we can engineer these backgrounds, like in this case, ADS3, S3, T4. And so because we have like, so the D1s, they are like one dimensional, uh, in spatial direction and one time direction. And so their near horizon limit uh, will become this ADS3 factor. And then if you look at the 10 dimensional uh, geometry, then there's an uh, additional four dimensions that I haven't used up and they become this, the angular directions of that become the S3. Um, and it was known, actually that was one of the initial examples of Matasena in his paper that uh, if you study the IR behavior of the gauge theory that lives on the D1, D5 uh, brains, then you can uh, conjecture what the dual CFT is. And from earlier studies of this, these IR behaviors of these gauge theories, it was known that you can describe them as some sigma model on uh, the instanton moduli space, which in this case you can argue is a deformation of the symmetric product OB-fold. So the symmetric product OB-fold will appear several times in this talk, and what I mean by the sim and T4 is just, I, it's a geometric space that consists of N copies of a four torus, uh, and then you mod out by the symmetric group action that permutes them. So it's an all fold space because that action is not free, but it has some fixed points. And uh, if you take this target space and you consider the geometric sigma model on it, then the claim is that this is the dual CFT, or more precisely, this is, the dual CFT lives on the same moduli space as this CFT. So let me make this uh, more precise because this understanding this, I think is quite important. Um, so both sides here have a large number of moduli. If you study, say the string moduli on ADS3 times S3 times T4, then you find- that uh, Was there a question? Okay. Uh, I don't uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So on the string side, for example, you find that there are 20 moduli. So they, they, they take the form of various uh, expectations, like various scalars and the geometry and various fluxes and so on. And uh, you can describe them neatly in terms of some coset that is 0, 0,4,5 over 0, 0,4 times 0, 0,5. And then there is a U duality group. So you should contrast this perhaps with the much more well-known example of ADS5 times S5. So in this case, we have a single complex modulus and it takes values in the upper half plane. Uh, which you could also write as a coset like this. Uh, but then there's also U duality group, which in this case is SL2Z. So this is the direct analog. So there is just the annoying feature that in these examples of ADS CFT holography, we have many, many more moduli. So there are 20 moduli in these uh, cosets. And I think that is one major reason why the map between the bulk and the boundary is quite unclear. So for ADS5 times S5, people always write down what is the map between parameters. But if you look in the literature for ADS3, this is actually largely unknown. And um, why the, like conceptually, why there are so many moduli, some of them you can understand. So some are trivial essentially because they're just determining the shape of the torus. So the torus can have different metric moduli and the B field moduli. But then there are some more non-trivial moduli. And in particular, you can support ADS3 either with NSNS flux or with Raman-Raman flux. So you uh, probably know that in type 2b string theory, 
with different uh, three form fluxes. One of them is the B field that couples directly to a fundamental string, but then there's also Ramond, Ramond uh, three form flux. And you can also use that to so support ADS3. And in general, you can have some mixture of those. So that explains partially why there are so many modules. And let me also um, mention some special points in the modular space that play a role. So one special point is the symmetric product overfilled itself. So that's a special point on the CFT side. But the symmetric product overfilled is not the most, I mean, in general, you have to turn on some deformation to go away from it. This is like saying this is free super mills in the ABS5 case. So you see some moduli are again in the T4, but if you count them, there are 16 moduli in the T4 and you're missing four more moduli that, that in general bring you away from the symmetric product overfold locus. And it's not clear for, for example, if you ask me where, what's the dual to supergravity in ADH three times S three times T4, then we have no idea. We can just say it's a deformation of that. And on the string side, we have also very special points so for example, we have the point we started with, namely the pure Ramon Ramon flux. So that's the point you get if you start engineering the background from a D1, D5 system because they source Ramon Ramon flux. We can also have pure NS and S flux. That's sort of the S dual picture of this. And you could call that the F1 NS5 system. So instead of having D5 system brains that wrap the T4, you could have these NS5 brains that are the magnetic dual of the fundamental string. So F1 is just the usual fundamental string that we start with to, to, to define string perturbation theory. And uh, so this pure ness ness flux is actually what will uh, occupy us for the rest of the talk. And uh, so we have this special point on the string side, but in particular, it's not clear here which one is dual to which or how, how are they related on the modern space. And uh, let me just mention what previously was uh, done mostly with these backgrounds. Um, so since I said like the dual theory to say supergravity on ADS three times S three times T four is not known, uh, but the only thing that is known is that it's a deformation of the symmetric product overfold. And so what people have done in the past is to compute many protected quantities and compare them. And that worked out spectacularly. So initially what people did is to look at uh, for example, the half BPS spectrum, which you can compute either from supergravity or from the word sheet. So these are the low lying half BPS states and they match with the symmetric product or before. And similarly, you can compute some elliptic genus that's some in protected index on the background and you can also match it to the symmetric product or before. You can compute extremal correlators that are also protected by supersymmetry. And in fact, uh, since we have also many experts on this in the audience, almost the whole fastball program in ADS3 is built upon this idea that you can identify some BPS states uh, in the symmetric product overfold and identify them with, with different geometries in the bulk. And of course, there was spectacular progress on, on this. Um, so in this talk though, I don't want to talk about any protected quantities at all. My question is really to uh, talk about the precise duals of these theories. And uh, as I said already, I will uh, consider the pure ness ness flux. And uh, the pure ness ness flux is special from a string theory point of view. And it's much simpler on the string side, at least if we're talking about string perturbation theory. And uh, the kind of fundamental reason why this is so is that the pure ness ness flux is sourced by this B field, and the B field couples directly to the string. Whereas if I would support my background with Ramon Ramon flux, then it wouldn't directly coupled to the fundamental string. So from a word sheet sigma po model point of view, how to include the B field is just that I add this additional term in the action. So this is the usual term that I would get. Uh, this is the kinetic term that describes the sigma model on some target space with some metric capital G mu nu. And I can just trivially add this B field also. Uh, and the B field is anti-symmetric, so I need to combine it with something anti-symmetric on the word sheet. So this is the general sigma model action. You could add also a, a dilaton to it, but let me not do that. And um, so for S, if you do this exercise and write down this action for ADS3, you actually find that it's nothing else than the WZW action for the group SL2R. So the WZW model is a particular conformal feed theory that people, uh, at least for compact groups, have known how to solve for a long time. 
And here ADS3 is a non-compact space and it just corresponds to this non-compact group sigma model. And to be precise, we should really talk about the universal cover of SL2R. So that's really the group um, that describes ADS3. And um, a, these uh, WCW models are usually expressed in terms of a level. They have a dimensionless number that people call level. And this level is just the size of ADS measured in units of string length. So you can already see, for example, this capital G mu nu will have some, like have this ADS length in front, ADS length squared. So you can just pull it out of the action and you get this dimensionless number K in front of the action. So this determines a lot of the physics. In particular, if we make K very big, then ADS becomes very big compared to the string length and we can neglect stringy effects. So that will be a supergravity regime if we make K very big. On the other hand, if we make K very small, then the string is very big uh, compared to ADS and it's sort of floppy and it's, uh, it's very extended in ADS. And that's what we sometimes call the tensionless limit of string theory in ADS3. So these are the two main uh, extremes to keep in mind. K big is supergravity, K small is this tensionless limit of string theory. And a, a recurring theme is that uh, the ADS CFT correspondence is a strong weak coupling duality. So what you should do is if to find a weakly coupled boundary theory and free boundary theory, you should make K very small such that stringy effects are very uh, important. If you make K very big and go to supergravity, then your dual CFT becomes much more complicated. So that's the general um, thing. And um, so let me uh, summarize this. Uh, so in ADS3 th string theory with pure NS NS flux is I think the simplest uh, ADS background, at least from a string theory point of view. It's certainly computationally among the most accessible backgrounds. And we can compute many things exactly in alpha prime. So they're exact in this parameter K, which translates to alpha prime. And uh, of course, and, and then we can tr treat them as string perturbation theory. Uh, so that's much more than what we can do for, say, ADS5. ADS5, we have some integrability and we can compute it to some loop order. And uh, in ADS5, we can compute mostly the spectrum. Here can we, we can go much further and compute things like correlation functions exactly in alpha prime and things like that. So that's, uh, we have computationally a lot more control. And so the kind of recurring theme of this talk is that we start with all this knowledge on the string side and we can try to directly uh, say what is the dual CFT that is dual to uh, these string theories. And uh, as I already said, uh, the string is described by this SL2R WCW model on the worksheet. And it, this has like a really long history of being studied in the literature. So I apologize again for not putting all the references. Uh, overall, I also apologize that my references are quite poor in this talk uh, since I didn't want to fit too much on these slides. Um, and, um, but I also already told you that uh, the pure NS NS background is among the least understood in terms of holography, I would say. Because the only thing that we can say is what is the dual of pure NS NS backgrounds is that it's some deformation of the symmetric product orbifold, but uh, this doesn't really give us any computationally advantage or anything. And in particular, it doesn't give us any understanding of the duality. We can just compare various things and it seems to work, but we don't know why. Um, so I think that's really an opportunity to learn more about ADS CFT. Um, so I think one thing that I also want to mention already at this point uh, that I think scares many people about these backgrounds is that they have the unusual property of having a continuous spectrum. So if you compute the spectrum, say, of ADS5 times S5, then of course it will be the same as super mills, and we're used to having some nice discrete spectrum. We can list all the states and they're uh, scaling dimensions and we get some nice spectrum. Uh, for ADS3, and we will see later why, turns out that there is a discrete sector in the Hilbert space and there's a continuous sector in the Hilbert space. And so we expect some space-time CFT that is non-compact. So it has some discrete states, but it also has some continuous states. And uh, that doesn't really make the CFT that much more complicated. So people always say, oh, the background is sick, we shouldn't consider it because of that. But I, it's a perfectly unitary theory. It makes perfect sense. Uh, you can compute anything you want, essentially. So I would really say it's a feature, not a bug. It's very much like Lilbert theory. We have a continuum, but we can deal with it. Um, 
Okay, but that's just as a warning uh, ahead. So then I also want to mention again this tensionless limit. Um, so the tensionless limit, I already told you that this, it corresponds to K being small because then the string becomes more floppy. And for ideas three times this three times T4, you can make it very precise. And in fact, if you put the most, uh, so for the supersymmetric backgrounds, K is quantized because it's the amount, another interpretation of K is it's the amount of NS and S flux in the background. So that better be an integer. So if K is one, that's the smallest amount you can have. Then uh, we actually argued in a series of papers and that has been ongoing since then, that uh, this is really the dual theory of the symmetric product orbifold itself. So with these papers, we answered at least the question, how is the symmetric product orbifold point related to any string point? And it turned out that it's the pure NS and S flux point with the least amount of flux. Um, that's still, that is very nice because it's a very simple ADCFT correspondence and we check many, many things about it. And I think by now it's quite well understood how this all fits together. But it tells you very little about what happens for the say string dual of supergravity, which corresponds to K being uh, 1 billion or whatever, that's something very big. Um, and I should also mention that there was also recent progress for different backgrounds from AD, not ADS3 times S3 times C4 and also very stringy backgrounds. And they have even K less than one as opposed to K being one uh, in this paper. And actually what they, they talk about is very much related to, to um, this talk. So they have a very similar proposal for the dual CFT. Okay, so this were like some corners of this tensionless limit where progress was made, but again, for like for large K, it's completely open what should be the dual CFT. And uh, so that's what I will aim to answer in this talk. Um, so the big question is what is the dual CFT of a pure NS and S ADS3 background? with some generic units of NS and S flux. So in particular, going close to supergravity. Um, and we will be able to answer this question directly uh, by just using string perturbation theory, computing quantities here. And uh, I hope I can convincingly show that there's a CFT that reproduces all these quantities. And that works at least in string perturbation theory. It's a little bit subtle to extend it to something non-perturbative and I don't know how to do this. And so as already as a spoiler, this question mark that you'll see of T will be a, again a symmetric orbifold, but it's not just a symmetric orbifold, but you need to turn on a very precise deformation. So I tell you very precisely what deformation to turn on. And it has this feature that it's, it will be a symmetric orbifold of a non-compact CFT. And so because of that, it will have this continuous spectrum. And uh, so this is ADS CFT correspondence is on the one hand nice because it's uh, it goes to this large K. So we're much closer to the supergravity regime. The downside until now, at least, is that we don't understand how it extends non-perturbatively. So we can only talk about things in string perturbation theory. So um, it's a different, very different corner of the parameter space than what was explored before. Okay, so that's more or less the plan. And uh, so I will uh, in the following start by reviewing various known things about uh, string theory in ADS3. So with the spectrum representations, correlation functions and so on. And then we will go to the dual CFT and we will make uh, some proposal that uh, reproduces all these uh, things that we saw on the string side. So again, like the following slides will still be reviewed, but a little bit more technical. Okay. So actually, um, we can even do the whole thing with Linux string. So just to save myself some technical difficulties, I will consider bosonic strings on ADS3 times X. Um, and there is a SUSY analog of this story, and it's essentially irrelevant for the whole story what X is. So uh, instead of like looking at many different backgrounds separately, we can just look at this ADS3 times X. Now, of course, I know that uh, this doesn't make sense at a uh, string loop level because there's a tachyon in the bosonic string. And so the whole correspondence will only work at uh, genus zero. But the whole, so we will anyway only talk about genus zero um, correlation functions and spectra and so on. But uh, there is a very natural SUSY analog of this whole story. So just to not clutter the slides with some fermions and so on, I will from, from now on assume that we're talking about the bosonic string. And you can ask me how, how the superstring works if you want to. Um, 
Okay, so again, the, the world sheet theory is controlled by this SL2R WZW model. And the WZW model features this large symmetry algebra. It's this affine Katz-Moody algebra. And um, just for reference, uh, these are commu the commutation relations. If you've never seen them, that's like the analog of, say, for the string in, um, in flat dimensions, say, in, uh, for flat target space, we, we all learned that there are these Heisenberg algebra commutation relations, something like that. And that's the direct analog of this. So there's also like this Katz-Moody algebra. The only difference is that it's non-abelian. I mean, we have like this uh, J, J commutator can give another J. So yeah. And this, in particular, the zero modes of this algebra generated the global ADS3, the global SL2R symmetry of the, of the ADS3 background. And you see here this parameter K again appearing that I mentioned already before. K is essentially, again, the units, the size of ADS measured in units of string length. OK, um, so then you can start. So since you have this nice algebra, you can treat this word sheet theory very uh, algebraically. And you can, in particular, analyze uh, all the word sheet spectrum has to fall into representations of this algebra. And these representations I want to quickly mention, uh, they are labeled by a spin. And there are essentially two sectors that correspond to this discrete to the uh, sector of discrete states in the Hilbert space and continuous states. And they, are, uh, they come uh, from discrete and continuous representations. So discrete representations uh, means that the spin, this SL2R spin is a real number. And uh, then there's also a condition of normalizability that imposes that the spin lies in this window. So if you look at, so the your Hil world sheet Hilbert space has these the sector, and if you look at the string states that are generated from the sector, then these are the so-called short strings. They lead to a discrete string spectrum, and every state that you know and love comes from the sector. So, for example, if you ask where's the graviton vertex operator, then it comes from the sector or the dilaton vertex operator, and so on. All the the, the operators. That, um, that have some representative say in supergravity that we know very well come from these discrete representations. Um, there, are, there are also continuous representations. And for continuous representations, this J is in the principal series. So it means that it's in one half plus IR. Uh, and th that still means that the Casimir is real valued because they cut the SL2R Casimir in my notations or my conventions is, is this. So if you make J in one half plus IR, then this number would be real. So uh, that is also an allowed unitary representation. And this Casimir, in fact, is invariant under sending J to one minus J. And that's a symmetry of the representation. So J's and one minus J's, they uh, describe equivalent representations. Their property is sometimes called reflection symmetry. And um, so the string states that these representations lead to are called long strings and they lead to this continuous uh, string spectrum. So let me show you, well, let me jump first here and show you a picture and then we go back so that you have a picture in mind. So roughly if you, uh, if you have ADS3, if you make a picture of ADS3 and you draw these string states, then uh, say these short strings, they come in from negative infinity and they sort of just pulse a little bit around say the center of ADS. So there are very localized excitations in ADS, and they're almost point-like, if you want. On the other hand, the long strings are sort of like scattering string, strings, and they come in from infinity. So if you go to past infinity, then they become get closer and closer to the boundary of ADS. And they come in, and at one point in ADS, they, they um, overlap, and then they go back out to infinity. So and uh, here you can also see from this picture that you should expect a, a discrete sector from here because there are some sec some set of bound states. Whereas here we can give uh, these strings some arbitrary radial momentum, and this radial momentum roughly corresponds to this imaginary part of the of the spin because the spin was in one half plus i r. Okay. So uh, that's about uh, these different two different sectors. And there's one more important comp uh, complication that comes on top of that, that is often called spectral flow. Because in ADS3, the, str the string states are more, moreover uh, classified by uh, having different spectrally flowed sectors, which roughly means some winding number of the string. 
And um, let me not get into the technical difficulties here, but uh, essentially there are some defi definition of these spectrally flowed representations. And um, so there are some unusual representations that are not highest, what you would usually call highest weight representations on the world sheet. Um, okay, the only thing that I want to mention is that this is, I mentioned that the zero mode of, um, of these currents are the global SL2R symmetry that corresponds to the conformal symmetry in the boundary theory. So the eigenvalue of J03 will always be the space-time conformal weight, because that's what we would call the space-time conformal weight if we would, like, let's say, J03. From a boundary CFT point of view, we would have called L0, the, uh, the Mobius generator. So the eigenvalue is the, the boundary conformal um, weight. And uh, so I'll just show you in pictures what this winding means. So uh, this state here would have a winding number of zero, whereas these states, this state here has a winding number of one. You can see that asymptotically this string winds exactly once around the boundary of ADS. And there are also string states uh, like this one that wind twice around the boundary. That's a little bit harder to draw, but you can imagine that you can have any winding, any asymptotic winding number around the boundary of ADS. And that's exactly what the spectral flow means. So the spectral flow is any uh, non-negative number that characterizes this number of windings. Um, okay, so these are roughly the string states that we have to deal with. And um, one thing that I also want to mention here is that, uh, so we have this, this continuous sector that comes from these long strings and they have a much simpler holographic interpretation because they are sort of scattering states. In particular, they reach the boundary asymptotically far out they, they touch the boundary. And so they, they are the states that are much simpler to describe in a dual CFD uh, language. And the short strings, they come about as some bound states of these long strings. And they are a little bit harder to see, but nonetheless, you can see them. Okay, um, I also, since most of the computations that, uh, that are done to compare with the dual CFT have to do with correlation functions, I very briefly want to tell you about vertex operators in this uh, theory. And uh, so there are vertex operators that correspond to all these, all these states. So we have discrete states, continuous states, spectrally flowed states, and so on. And uh, they're most naturally described actually in Euclidean ADS, because the simplest computations you can do is to compare with, so you want to compare with the duals 2D CFT. And 2D CFTs we most naturally describe in Euclidean space. And so because of that, it's also very natural to analytically continue our background or our worksheet theory to Euclidean ADS3. And in Euclidean ADS3, there is a so-called X basis. And that's just a word to say we mean the position basis of the boundary. Um, so if we compute some correlation function of these vertex operators, these vertex operators depend on the boundary coordinate and the worksheet coordinate. And in string theory, we need to integrate over worksheet coordinates at the end of the day, we still have a correlation function, then the string coordinate is a correlation function that still depends on the boundary coordinates, and that is exactly the CFT correlation function. By the way, please interrupt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so about this um, uh, analytic continuation, because I, I thought uh, as a consequence of the analytic continuation on the worksheet, you end up with the SL2C mod, uh, I forgot what, uh, theory which uh, turns out to have a very different spectrum and so on yes. wouldn't it have been simpler to analytically continue instead the boundary safety that you're comparing to which um, i mean we know yeah we know so about. okay what you're referring to uh i i don't think that is simpler and i think it's also important to clarify so when you analytically continue just like if you analytically continue lorentzian cft you're still defining normalizability of the states using the lorentz in a, in a product you're not suddenly changing the the, the inner the norm and uh, defining normalizability you using the Euclidean inner product. So the spectrum will be of the CFT is exactly the same as the one in Lorentzian ADS, because otherwise there wouldn't be any states that satisfy the, the say the uh, mass shape condition. Normalizability. Yeah. So um, so the the theory is not really this H. I don't know what the proper name of this theory is. I always call the analytic continuation of the SL2R WZW model, but it's not what people sometimes call the SL2C mod SU2 theory, because that theory doesn't have any spectral flow in it, uh, for example. So because you're defining different normalizability. 
And could you just uh, briefly comment if you find it interesting on why you think that uh, analytically continuing the, the boundary safety uh, would, would be difficult or not make sense? Uh, yes. Um, well, I don't know because I haven't tried. So what scares me about it is that the boundary theory is an orbifold theory. So it's, it's manifestly described in terms of some orbifold field, some twist fields. And I don't really know uh, very well how to analytically continue twist fields to Lorentzian signature. So that's a little bit subtle because twist fields are manifestly constructed using a Euclidean uh, signature. I do think it's very interesting, but I don't think that anyone has really tried to do this. Everyone treats the symmetric product orbifold in a Euclidean 2D CFT setting. And uh, I know very little about the Lorentzian analog of it. I, I do agree it should be it should exist, but uh, I don't know how to uh, do it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so we have these vertex operators, and they depend on all the quantum numbers that I mentioned so far. So we have uh, our spectral flow quantum number. Here uh, we have our spins that again are either discrete or continuous. We have this H. H is just something like the magnetic quantum number and it corresponds to the space-time conformal weight of the vertex operator. And then we have this, sorry, we have the space-time position X and we have the world sheet position Z. And uh, then there's also, you could compute the world sheet conformal weight of these operators. And there is some slightly complicated formula for it. Uh, so if you put the spectral flow to zero, if this W is zero, then these two terms are not there. And then it's basically just the Casimir of the representation. And of course, in the string setting, you want that this world sheet conformal weight is equal to one or zero, depending whether you talk about the bosonic string or the super string. And of course, that gives some constraint on the possible quantum numbers here. And also in the string, you would integrate over Z. So in the space-time theory, you only have three out of these five labels, basically. Um, OK. So now let me quickly tell you what's known about their correlation functions. And so you can compute correlation functions of these objects. And uh, again, that has a long history. I just put uh, one paper here that was very important in that respect. And uh, for example, the two-point function has long been known. The two-point function um, is, is very simple and it's very similar to say Liouville two-point function. So there are delta functions that impose that the space-time conformal weights are the same, that the spectral flows are the same. And there, then there are two terms because either the j's can be the same or like here, or they can be related as j to one minus j because there's this reflection symmetry in the uh, theory. So we better have both uh, of these um, delta functions there. And then there's one constant that you can com uh, compute here that's the reflection coefficient. That is basically the normalization how the representation with the spin j is related to a representation with spin one minus j. So that's the, the two-point function for long strings for the continuous sector. You can extract from that the two-point function also of the discrete sector. But mostly I'll talk about the continuous sector uh, correlation function. From that you can, uh, I'll tell you in a second how to get the uh, discrete sector correlation functions. And uh, one useful analogy is that, again, as always, is that this is very similar to Liouville theory. And you can think of long strings as being like waves that are scattering uh, at some potential wall. And uh, there are some ingoing wave and some outgoing wave. And that's why you have this reflection symmetry in the theory. And uh, so let me just quickly tell you what is this reflection coefficient. So this is just uh, some simple expression. It's just a bunch of gamma functions that are not too important. Um, just uh, to highlight some features is that there is some constant mu that is the analog of the coupling constant that we usually call mu in Liouville theory. So there is some coupling constant in the theory, but it doesn't really have any physical significance because uh, you can always reabsorb it into the definition of your string coupling constant in the end. So if you want, you can set it to one and just ignore for the rest of the talk. Um, so this reflection coefficient has various poles and these poles have physical significance. So whenever we have a pole in such a uh, like reflection coefficient, we already know from quantum mechanics, then there are some corresponding bound state in the problem. And so for example, and we have essentially two types of poles. One type of pole is when uh, this space-time conformal weight takes some particular value. 
and this particular value is uh, say let's focus on the first one where h is equal to j plus this kw half plus an integer and uh, so this in this paper here by Aharoni, Gibran, Kutasov, these poles were called LSZ type of poles and they're basically like some rough analogy you should think of is if you have some scattering amplitude in some q of t and you put some particle on shell then there's a pole and so this here is because you put some particle on shell and because of that, uh, and there they exist precisely where you expect short strings. So for short strings, these inequalities are true because um, short string representations are representations that are not, I mean, they're lowest weight representations say, and your age uh, takes some minimal value in the representation. And this minimum value coincides precisely with J plus KW half. So uh, you don't have to understand all, I, I don't want to tell you about all this representation theoretic details, but the important thing to notice is just that there are these poles and the poles are precisely where you expect short strings. There are also other poles uh, that are in the same paper called bulk poles, and they emerge basically because ADS3 is non-compact. So AS3 is non-compact, so we have to integrate over some non-compact space. And sometimes uh, there's like a resonance in this integral, and that leads to a pole as well in the correlation function. And that pole de doesn't depend on, um, on H, on the conformal weights of the boundary at all. And uh, yeah, so the way to think about it is really that it comes from the non-compact volume. And you would also have these types of pole in, say, Leoville correlation function, you perhaps know that there are various poles and say the DOZZ formula that uh, come if, if, if like the sum of momenta takes some special values. And if that's the case, then you can compute these poles using the Coulomb gas formula. And I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so, but we fundamentally have these two types of poles and correlation functions. So let me very briefly mention a three-point function, but I don't want you to pay any attention to this formula. I just want to mention that the three-point functions are actually also known. And there's some closed form formula for the three point functions in this X basis. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are some case distinctions and so on. And uh, like everything is very explicit, but very complicated. That's the main message. And uh, there's again some function that has the same type of bulk poles and LSZ poles. And the LSZ poles again correspond to short strings. So that's quite unique, I think. So we have some three point function here that is exact in alpha prime. Admittedly, it's the leading G string order. So it's just on the sphere, a three point function. So, but we can just ask is there any space time CFT that has the same three point functions? That's at large n. That's what we should ask now. In fact, we also extended this to four point functions. There's even a closed form formula for four point functions. But let me not get into that. Um, okay, so that was more or less what I wanted to say about the string side. So I guess now would be another good point for questions if there are any. Okay, um, then uh, let me tell you now what I think the dual CFT is. Um, okay, again, we consider bosonic string on this background of the form ADS three times X, where X is uh, some compact internal CFT that doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that first of all, it's compact. I don't want another continuum from there. And the central charge should be such that the whole background is critical. So the central charge of the SA2RWZW model you can compute and it says 3K over K minus two. And so the central charge of this X better be 26 minus that so that the whole central charge is 26. And so it was already observed in this paper that I wrote with Matthias uh, three years ago that if you just talk about the spectrum of long strings on this background, then it matches a certain CFT and uh, uh, well, we wrote it slightly differently, but the CFT essentially is the symmetric product OB fold of a linear dilaton theory. Uh, so this RQ, I mean, like a free boson, but with the background charge and times X. Okay, so let me explain what various things mean here. So first of all, what is the background charge of this linear dilaton theory? So that I called Q here. So one nice way of writing it is that Q is B inverse minus B where B is one over root K minus two. And that is also equal to K minus three over root K minus two. And so if you're familiar with Leoville theory, this formula looks wrong because usually we put a plus here, 
but I really do mean a minus. So some formulas in the following look almost correct, but they are really correct in the setting, but in the over theory, they would be slight, <laughs> they look slightly different. And okay, so we have this uh, theory. And uh, so roughly speaking, why this should be plausible to you that the symmetric product overfold has the same long string spectrum is that RQ leads to continuum in a spectrum. So this, this uh, theory has only a continuous sector in Hilbert space, there's no discrete sector. So it's not quite the same thing. That's why I wrote try the, the, the correct thing. That's why I wrote try one. There will be a try two, that's the correct thing. And um, so, so this, this uh, theory here has um, basically RQ you should think of as being the radial direction of ADS3. So when you impose physical state conditions on ADS3 times X, you're throwing out two physical directions and you're just remaining with transverse uh, oscillations of the string. So, and the transverse oscillation of the string are roughly described by this radial direction of ADS3 times the internal space X. So one way to think of this RQ times X is just that it's imposing the physical state conditions of the string and you're, you're throwing out two directions. And then you're taking the symmetric product overfold of that because you're not just want to, you don't just want to describe a single string, but you want to describe many strings and they're indistinguishable. So you better divide up the symmetric group action of the symmetric, uh, yeah, of the symmetric group. And um, so, yeah, the dictionary here is that if you have, so the linear dilaton direction has some momentum associated to it. And we started with some spin on the word sheet. And the relation is that the linear dilaton momentum alpha is related to the spin by that formula. And in particular, you can see that if you choose J to be in one half plus IR, then this alpha will be in Q half plus IR, which is what you would expect, say, if this would be a, a Liouville theory. Okay, so that's uh, one observation you can make. You can compute the full string spectrum of long strings, and you can compute the spectrum of this theory, and they two match. So that's already quite strong, um, but for various reasons, this is not the correct theory. So we have to slightly modify it. Uh, so here are th at least three reasons why it's not the correct theory. So this CFT would have an exact U1 symmetry because there's this linear dilaton direction. It's anomalous because of the background charge, but still there's a U1 symmetry. And this symmetry is clearly not there on the string side. So there is like the written, like there is no symmetry that corresponds to like say going out to the boundary of, uh, of ADS. Similarly, there is no reflection symmetry in this model. So if you just have a linear dilaton uh, theory, then there's no reason for you to identify something like in and outgoing states because there's no potential. And uh, finally, if maybe most obviously, there are no short string states in this model. And so you're missing uh, half, of the, half of the string states. So clearly this can't be the correct thing. And uh, perhaps what I said already suggests what we should do is we're missing kind of a wall that makes the long strings return to the boundary. So we're just having for now, we're not scattering anything. It's a free theory, this linear dilaton theory. So we need this potential wall uh, that creates in and outgoing waves. So I can have a question. Yes. Um, so at the beginning of the talk, you, you mentioned that among the uh, nice uh, discrete representations are all the conserved currents and so on, the yes. graviton and yes. others. So uh, wouldn't you have uh, candidates for those discrete states in, in, in just this symmetric product that you wrote? Oh, good question. Yes, you do, but they are not part of the spectrum. So for example, again, if you think about Liouville theory, then in Liouville theory, you have a perfectly fine stress energy tensor, but it's not itself part of the spectrum. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so that's exactly the same situation here. So yes, you can write down uh, candidates, but, but they wouldn't be normalizable in this theory. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, good. So yeah, so the resolution perhaps is slightly obvious, but what's not so obvious is what operator you should add. So you should add some operator to the theory that uh, that uh, creates this potential and makes um, makes these long string scattering waves return again to the boundary. And um, so with Matthias, we actually proposed a different um, operator, but this I think is not the correct one. And the one that I'm proposing here is the correct one. Um, so, so the operator that you should add is uh, this, okay. Let me explain a little bit more. So the symmetric product obifold, first of all, has twisted sectors. So there are twist fields. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know how much I should explain about this, but it, whenever you have some orbifold, then there are twist fields because your field, if you can, if you insert the twist field somewhere and you look at, at the monodromy of the other fields, then they don't necessarily have to go back to themselves, but they only have to go back to this themselves up to some group action by which you orbifold it out. So in this case, this twist two operators, the twist field, define such that if you go around this twist field, then the um, some other, say the like linear Dilaton field or any other field in the theory only goes back to itself up, up to a group action. And that group action is a, is a permutation of two uh, elements in the symmetric group. It's just a transposition. And um, so that is some twist field that you very naturally have in the symmetric product over before. And now you dress this up with this exponential vertex operator in the linear dilaton direction, because that was the original motivation that we should add this wall here. So that if you have this red ingoing wave, there will be corresponding blue outgoing wave. And because of that, we will have a reflection symmetry in the model. And we also would also kill this U1 symmetry that is there. And as we see, that also leads to the correct bound states that account for the short string spectrum. Um, okay, so this operator is not normalizable. Uh, because obviously it blows up here. So if you would compute the norm, it's clearly infinite. And so it modifies the theory drastically. In particular, adding this to the theory is not completely straightforward. So, um, well, let me first naively add it. And now you could define a dual CFT by perturbing this operator phi. And what you would define uh, is just saying that, okay, now you take some, uh, some correlation function of some operators that for now I call o, o of alpha i, and you define them in conformal perturbation theory. So that means you just insert some number of these marginal twist operators, and you just sum over all possible insertions. And um, so since this is a non-normalizable operator, this perturbation theory is actually quite subtle, and that's why I put the quotation marks around here. And um, again, if you're familiar with this, a picture, very useful picture to keep in mind is uh, how to define Liouville theory from linear dilaton theory. And in this context, this kind of equation would be the Coulomb gas formalism, where you can compute Liouville correlators by free field correlators and inserting some number of marginal operators. And what one has to do there is what's sometimes called in literature analytically continue the perturbation series because let's think how the right-hand side looks like. So these are free field correlators here on the right-hand side. And in particular, there's a momentum conserving delta function for them. So this will be momentum conserving delta function and we're summing infinitely many of them. So what qualitatively the right-hand side looks like is an infinite sum of different delta functions. They're not all the same because this phi shifts the argument of the delta function. But it's clearly not what we would have exact, for example, in Dilworth theory where we have some nice meromorphic function, but analytic function of these alpha i's, not some sum of delta functions. Um, so also in this context, what should happen is that the actual correlators on the left-hand side are meromorphic functions in these spins alpha i or momenta alpha i, and they have poles. And whenever they have, have a pole, then the right-hand side has a delta function. So what happens, at least in Liouville theory, is that these delta functions of the free theory gets smeared out into simple poles in the actual interacting deal with you. And the only thing that you can do using this conformal perturbation theory is you can compute the residue of these poles. You cannot compute the actual function on the left-hand side, but you can compute the residue of the pole. And the residue of the pole is a prefactor of the delta function. So the idea is that the delta function gets smeared out to a pole. Okay, because delta function and pole is kind of the same thing a little bit, because for example, they satisfy the same uh, differential equation. Um, I don't know, like, let me write this. So for example, like the differential equation that the delta function satisfies is this one, but the differential equation that the pole satisfies is the same one. And so they're a little bit like the same objects. And so it, it's plausible that a uh, delta function can be smeared out to the pole. So that's uh, the, the working assumption. And what we assume now is that there is a CFT with these correlation functions uh, with this bracket mu. And all I know at least uh, to do at the moment is to access residues of these correlators. I cannot access the correlators themselves, but what I can do is to compute residues at various locations. And um, it's not clear to me how to construct the CFT from first principles. 
And it's also not clear to me whether it exists non perturbatively meaning at finite n. Uh, because it's kind of, uh, I mean, it's some assumption that you have to make that these correlators do exist, and then you can check that you can access various parts of these correlators. But I don't know any way of computing the full correlator from some first principles. But uh, so that's what I think that UOCFT is, and I give you all the evidence in a second. But uh, at least perturbatively in the string coupling, that seems to do the correct job and compute everything we want to compute. Um, okay. So are there any questions on that? So yeah, I may have one because uh, yeah. na naively, uh, this is a very naive question, but uh, na na naively when you do this uh, CFT perturbation theory, I would think that you are just uh, moving in moduli space away from the, the symmetry Gorby fold point to go to an interacting point. But you seem to say that it's, it's really a different theory. So it's not like you're yeah. moving in the moduli space because of the fact uh, that yeah. the operator is not uh, normalizable. Yes, uh, yes, that's correct. And well, one thing that I should also already mention, for example, in so everything is very similar to level theory. Level theory will also have some interaction constant, and it basically doesn't matter what that constant is. You can always scale it away, uh, but like it's important that it's non-zero. But what value it takes, it doesn't matter because it's just some pre-factor of all the correlation. Uh, okay, like the potential. And, yeah. And in particular, also only one, it's always only one order in this perturbation theory that can potentially compute to the residue because these delta functions, they're all shifted. Uh, and so like if you tune your spins of i to be the correct, uh, have, having the correct sum, then the residue is computed by a single term on the right hand side. So it's not that you're resumming some perturbation theory or something. Um, Okay, uh, maybe that helps or maybe not. And uh, like also one thing that you maybe also might already complain about is that this theory has too many parameters because it has this constant mu and it has the n in it, like uh, the symmetric orbifold with n copies that you started with. So it has two parameters, whereas on the world sheet side, you only see one parameter. And you, you'll see in a second that at least in the one over n expansion at the leading order in one over n, there's actually only one parameter and one, the other parameter you can absorb in, into various normalizations. So there's only one physical parameter in this theory. The other one is uh, unphysical. And so this, what, what mu you actually choose doesn't really matter. The only thing is uh, the it's important thing is that you turn it on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Is there a shift equation for, for the three point functions? Uh, not that I know of. No, I, I don't necessarily think. Well, so you're asking whether there is some shift equation like the Upsilon equation satisfies and that uses the equal formula? Uh, yes, so no, yes, yeah, so you're making the analogy with the evil theory. And in yeah. the evil theory, you have a, a shift equation for the three point functions, which allows you to solve for them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I understand. Uh, not that I know of. So there are some traces of this, but not for the full three point function. Let me go back. I actually wrote a three point function. But uh, so, what has a so there are two parts of this three point function, roughly speaking. So, there's this D, that is the three point function of three unflowed vertex operators. If you would, would put all these W's to be zero, so you don't consider any spectral flow, then all the rest goes away. This stuff doesn't, is not there. And you just get this D. And this D is the unflowed uh, three point function that was determined by Teschner. That one is very similar to the three point function, and it does have a shift equation. I don't think that the full thing does have a shift equation because if you would shift J around here, then J would also be shifted in these complicated exponents and I don't know what happens. And from a dual CFT point of view, there's no reason to have such a shift equation because there's no null vector that would lead to it. So you're probably having in mind that there's some null vector, you can compute some four point function with one degenerate field and that leads to the shift equation. I don't see any, any such null vector here. Um, yeah, so I mean, it might be, but Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, right. Okay, so let me first explain some more physical aspects of this correspondence, and then uh, I go to the tests, and, and that will be very quick. So I think I won't go too much over time now. Okay, so the CFT, first of all, has, has a genus expansion. It better has, be, ha has to have, otherwise we are already screwed. And uh, you can work out what is the genus G contribution to a collator and has some universal scaling, just like, again, Leo theory would have some universal scaling. And there's a, a part that comes from mu, from this interaction piece. 
And that one you can determine by this kind of KPZ scaling argument. So it's a very similar argument to, again, Liebel. And then there's a piece that comes from combinatorics, from counting like various, like how many contractions do various things have in this metric group. And that leads also to, to a genus dependent factor. Sorry. And you can see that uh, that's already what I mentioned to Guillaume, uh, that there's only one actually actual thing that depends on the genus, one combination. And that is this mu to the k minus three over k minus two times n minus to the minus one half. So uh, that is the thing that actually depends on the genus. Everything else, so you can absorb in the like normalization of vertex operators. Um, and that's the only physical uh, coupling constant in the theory. And so in the large n limit, the CFT only depends non-trivially on this combination uh, that is to be identified with the string coupling. And so both sides of the correspondence have the right number of parameters. So essentially on the string side, you're specifying some radius of ADS3. So that's determined by this K. You have some string coupling and you have some your internal CFT and they directly go over to the other side. Um, okay. So now let me explain you how to match these things. And I think that's the most non-trivial part, but also the most technical part. So I, I won't explain any computations that are done. Um, but essentially what you want to check is that if you compute this three-point function in the string theory, which you can just compute by taking the three-point function in the word sheet theory, and there's some normalization of some string path integral in front, then you want to see that it, it exactly matches to a three-point function in this proposed CFT. And I showed you roughly before what is a three-point function in the string theory, so it's quite complicated. And so it's quite non-trivial to reproduce this from a CFT. And so the first thing you can check is that this, this thing has various poles. I told you it has these LSZ type of poles and it has these bulk poles. And the bulk poles correspond to the poles that you would expect from this side when you do conformal perturbation theory, because here you get a bunch of delta functions. And what you can do is you can compute the residue of these bulk poles using conformal perturbation theory. Uh, so the first thing you check is that the set of poles agrees. So that's already nice. And then you can check that on these poles, at least in the first ones, you always reproduce the correct residue. And uh, I played this game up to fourth order in conformal perturbation theory, and then I got tired of it. But uh, I don't have any general kind of method to do this. And it's every order is slightly different and kind of complicated. But you can check up to fourth order that the first five poles uh, match the residues on both sides completely match. And they're quite non-trivial functions. Um, OK, so that's the first kind of match you can do. Um, you can also, actually, we recently extended this to four-point function. I already mentioned that we have string four-point functions also under control. Then you have to deal with conformal block expansions and things like that. And you can also check that, first of all, the set of all poles and four-point functions matches with the set of all poles and the four-point function you would have expected in this dual CFT. And you can also check that the first residues agree on both sides. Uh, again, so you can actually match some non-trivial four-point functions in this context. So I'm not aware of any other uh, ADS CFT where you can do that, something like that. Um, let me also briefly mention some, you can even make some tests that go beyond conformal perturbation theory. So until now, I only told you about, you can compute various things in conformal perturbation theory and they match, but there are actually various predictions that follow from this duality that you can check and they are like beyond conformal perturbation theory. So for example, in the CFT, you can compute a two-point function. And if you would uh, take a derivative in the CFT with respect to this coupling constant mu, then by definition, what you should get is just a three-point function with one more marginal operator inserted. Because this marginal operator was precisely had coupling constant mu. So if we take a derivative of this, this correlation function with respect to mu, we just insert this marginal operator and integrate it over space. And then you can look at the correspondence and see what phi corresponds to on the worksheet. Some particular vertex operator in the worksheet coming from the spectrally flowed, the twice spectrally flowed sector because phi was in the twist two sector. And uh, so what this predicts is that if you compute a three point function of two generic operators and the special operator, then it's very simply uh, related to an ordinary two point function. And up to some constants that come from this normalization of string path integrals and blah, blah, blah. But uh, otherwise, like this, these are two things are basically the same. 
And if you compute the left-hand side, it's some horribly complicated formula, but somewhat miraculously simplifies and reduces to the right-hand side. So that's one test that you can do that is uh, completely independent of conformal perturbation theory and sort of shows that even non-perturbatively in this deformation, this is the correct uh, operator to add. Okay, so I'm basically done. The very last thing that I haven't told you about, the last piece in the puzzle is the short strings. I've told you about uh, that this CFT has the correct long string spectrum. You can compute correlation functions of these long strings and they match with the word sheet theory. The only th missing piece is that we haven't told about, uh, I haven't told you about the short string spectrum, how it comes about in the CFT. And for that, we should remember that we had this LSZ type of poles. So the LSZ type of poles and correlators were poles that uh, affected the conformal weights H, whereas these other bulk poles that we talked about until now didn't involve the conformal weights H. And they arise, arise every time that H, so because on the world sheet there were these lowest weight representations, so H is bounded from below, and the precise uh, formula is this one. And okay, so, but now it's very simple uh, because we already know that the correlators of the long in the long string spectrum of the string theory and the proposed CFT are identical, at least up to like uh, at least all the tests that we have done that worked out. And so you can also deduce the short string spectrum directly from the CFT side, because also the CFT correlators will have poles directly at uh, at these locations. And these poles are completely independent of the bulk poles. So it actually suffices if you can compute only the residues of the CFT correlation function, you already know about this LSC type of poles. You don't need to compute the full result. And um, so then you see that you need to include also these short string states in the CFT. And you should think of them as being some bound states that are far in, like close to this exponential ball uh, in the theory. And so now you can uh, get actually a full match of the spectrum that includes both the discrete and the continuous series representations or the short and long strings. And uh, of course, there are many more things that one could explore, but for now, I think this is at least a semi-complete picture of how, how things uh, match. Okay, so uh, let me conclude and then uh, get more questions. So, so let me just repeat the main proposal. Uh, so the take home message is that if you take the symmetric product all before of a linear dilaton direction times X, and the linear dilaton again had this value, and you deform it by a particular operator that involves both the twist two sector and involves this, uh, this exponential perturbation in the linear dilaton direction, then I would propose that this is the dual CFT to at least perturbative uh, strings on ADS three times X with pure NS and S flux. So for now, this was the bosonic version and there's some very natural SUSY analog. And we checked two and three point functions and even some four point functions and conform a perturbation theory and they, they match perfectly. And you can also see that the full spectrum, so that's the exact spectrum in alpha prime, gets reproduced correctly on both sides. And yeah, so that's it for me. So I'm happy to get more questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Do you do the shaman, Andrea, or shaman? <laughs> Okay, uh, other questions? <laughs> yeah, sorry, could I have uh, another naive question about the um, stress tensor again? Yes. So, uh, so, so previously you, you told me that before you did the deformation, this, this didn't correspond to some normalizable state, but now yes. it should. Yes. However, you're in ADS3, so from the bulk point of view, I would have expected this stress tensor to just uh, correspond to some boundary excitation, right? Right, but so, uh, yes. I agree. So, so yeah. So, how should I picture it? Be because you you just uh, told us that the discrete state, so the, the short string should be lying somewhere close to this um, wall. But, yes. Yeah. So, how should I understand the stress? Oh, tensor? okay. Um, yeah. So, so first of all, this wall was a slightly um, maybe. Okay. So it's not completely trivial how this wall uh, translates to a radial direction, and that's also not completely clear to me because from this point of view, you're just computing various things and they match, and one uh, also perhaps slightly confusing thing is that if you draw this wall, so it looks something like this. So this you would think is the boundary uh, of ADS where the wall is weak. 
Uh, but actually, here is this like for generic K, this is the strong coupling region. Um, so it's it's a little bit so the strong coupling in the sense that the string coupling becomes strong because there's a linear dilaton direction. And so the string coupling becomes stronger in one uh, direction. And it's actually strong in the asymptotic region. So it's not completely clear where you would say this state is localized. Um, and I, I'm afraid I don't have anything useful to say about it. But um, well, also one thing you should say is like the de-stress energy tensor of all the string modes. So it's not just like pure gravity, that's is complete boundary modes, but there are also massive fields in the theory. And it's a stress energy tensor for all of these states. So it's not necessarily true that it's only boundary gravity. Well, uh, well uh, no, normally when, um, may, maybe this is a different, because I, I thought if I'm in asymptotically AD state, so in, in, in the usual scenarios, I, I just do a KK reduction over the, the compact directions and the, for, for the contributions to the stress, stress tensor, I only care about the pure 3D gravity sector, right? Which are just uh, okay. yeah. right. um, large, pure large gauge modes. Yeah, yeah, but okay, but but so so but I thought the question is like you like yeah. So there is a rough intuition that the, the the bound states are localized somewhere, but yeah, I don't know whether this intuition really holds. Uh, um, but I mean, I agree. Like these, they are just boundary gravitons, and um, well, they should yeah, be localized. Yeah. Okay, very good. I, I, I guess my confusion is maybe I don't have any intuition from for your setup, but I, I thought that uh, just generically in a theory of gravity with a boundary, the the boundary gravity also be on the boundary. Well, <laughs> they are also because we're talking about the boundary CFT. But <laughs> um, right, because yeah. they're modes of uh, of the gauge yeah. field. Of gauge but, field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't have anything more useful to say. But but yeah, because you, you argued for the existence of these bound states from uh, from the poles in in the correlation functions. But do do you have a better picture, like physical picture, for why they suddenly start existing and so on? Uh, no, not Just really. I mean, but you can see that the, it's necessary to include them in the spectrum because if you have like poles in the four point function, you do conformal block expansions, then it can happen that you pick up these poles uh, because. Sure. Uh, and things like that. So you see that they, they need to be part of the spectrum. But how do they exactly look like as like some space-time profile? I, I don't know uh, from this picture. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I have a question. Uh, can you comment on uh, a bit on the K, the K greater than three and smaller than three Ks? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. if, because you show us the chart changes sign and in the relation between the string coupling and the deformation parameter, the exponent goes to zero if you um, go right. Through. Yeah, so that's uh, interesting question. So first of all, I should mention to not confuse anyone. So k to three in this conventions because we're talking about the bosonic string would be the same as this k to one point in the superstring. Um, okay, so first, and the picture that I drew here is k bigger than three. So where the strong coupling region is the near the boundary of ADS. For k smaller than three, which is the very tensionless limit. Uh, the two sides are reversed. So because the slope of the linear dilaton turns around. And uh, so that's why, for example, in this paper by Martinek and Gibeon Kutasov and Baltasar, they talk about this asymptotically free uh, ADS-CFT correspondence. So there the boundaries, the, the scattering strides are really asymptotically free. So it's a simpler theory than this one here. And uh, well, then you were also, I think, asking about this form there that there's this exponent yeah. here came in. This one I think doesn't really matter because uh, like the only important thing is so large n is always large. Let's say uh, n is one billion and mu says of order one, but it doesn't really matter how the exponent of mu comes about. So as long as you make n your largest parameter in your theory, then uh, so whether this this exponent is positive or negative doesn't really matter. I think. I mean, it comes from the fact that there was a q here because the the slope turns around. But uh, so there's always a well-defined weak. So this G string, you can always make weak, no matter whether k is bigger than three or smaller than three. That doesn't have any influence. Um, yeah, so the only thing that, that is perhaps slightly bad and that makes it perhaps confusing and non-perturbative completion of the theory is that this slope turns around to the strong coupling regions near the boundary of ADS. For all these computation, it doesn't play any role whatsoever. You can always compute everything exactly. 
and uh, everything is analytic in particular in k so you can just if you want analytically continue every result for k smaller than three to k bigger than three so at least in perturbation theory i think there's no subtlety in that uh, there might be subtleties if you try to understand non perturbative physics Okay, thank you. Because I thought in other proposals there was an issue with uh, the other region. Uh, yeah, so so I mean, so like for example, that. Martinek and collaborators for them, them there's an issue. Because they they're not doing perturbative string computations, but uh, so I mean, I think they're convinced by now also of this. I talked with them a long time uh, that this works at least. I mean, I'm careful to say only string perturbation theory. I have no idea what happens non-perturbatively and they want to say things non-perturbatively. Uh, so that's a big difference. And um, yeah, so, and one last related thing perhaps is if you put K exactly equal to three or K to one in a super string. So then this matches with the fact that you get just a symmetric product or before without any deformation because basically mu decouples from the theory completely. Q is uh, equal to one, uh, sorry, Q is equal to zero. So this is just a free boson. And there's no mu dependence anymore. And so essentially, it's like as if you don't turn on the deformation at all. Uh, so that's why for this cake one, you just get a symmetric product. Oh, we put no deformation. Either. Thanks. Okay. Are there other questions? Can you maybe also comment uh, to the relation of one of your earlier papers on summing over geometries for this uh, in this proposal and the grand canonical ensemble interpretation? Um, yes, so that's also a good question. So yeah, so maybe I should first say, so in the previous papers, so we only studied, or I studied only this cake to one uh, limit where we are just getting a symmetric product orbifold. So it's a much simpler theory and we can compute many things exactly. And one uh, statement that is not visible in, in this uh, leading order in string perturbation theory that played a, an important role there that I expect also to carry over here is that actually, if you look at the symmetric product orbifold with one fixed n, like let's say n very large, but fixed, then this doesn't correspond to, that is not what string perturbation theory would compute. Instead, what string perturbation theory computes is the sum over all n. So because n itself is the number of, one, one interpretation is that's the number of fundamental strings. So you have some very large number of background strings, but then you're adding some probe strings on top of it. So these probe strings can actually change the value of n. So instead of what you're getting is not like a symmetric orbit for that one fixed n, but at like all n. Uh, for large n, this doesn't really matter because like, uh, like to first order, you're not changing the background value. Um, so it doesn't matter for this, but eventually it will matter. I'm quite sure of this. So the correct statement I should probably say here is that the symmetric product of fold of n deformed by this operator is not dual to what you would usually call string perturbation theory, but it's a slightly modified string perturbation theory that you can still compute everything by string perturbation theory, but there are some additional rules. You have to be careful to essentially not overcount the identity operator. So what? Well, Okay, maybe one other way to say this is that there are two ways to say what is the identity operator in this theory, because there's an explicit operator in the word sheet theory that is dual to the identity, but then the identity is also dual on the string side to essentially nothing, because for example, the disconnected contribution to a four point function, you can compute either by like two disconnected uh, two point functions, two spheres that are disconnected, or you could uh, compute it by a connected four point function with one identity channel inserted. So that's essentially where this problem is coming. And yeah, so you asked me about uh, whether like the summing over geometries holds. And of course, I don't know because I don't know what the non perturbative completion of this duality is. And so yeah, there, the idea was that you shouldn't sum over geometries because every, every geometry leads to the same uh, boundary contribution essentially. And I would hope that it's true, but uh, I don't know at the moment how to compute anything there because I guess first one should understand whether this somehow continues to hold at finite n and how it continues to hold. Um, so I would be like, I mean, there's a stupid argument you can make that the summing over geometry property holds true always. That is um, at least in some approximate sense, because if, if it holds true at the symmetric product or full point in the modular space and you deform away from this point, then it better be true. Like then this duality kind of should 
um, continue to hold true. So I don't expect that suddenly you should sum over geometries and like at the tensionless point, you shouldn't sum over geometries. But of course, I don't really know. Um, yeah, so these are just uh, random, random things I can say. <laughs> Sorry, could I have a, another question about your um, long strings? So, so these long strings are a characteristic of uh, NSNS backgrounds. Yes. And uh, so these are supposed to be at uh, special points or maybe special subspaces in the D1D5 moduli space. Yes. So, um, so what would happen? So if you try to now um, act with a um, with an exactly marginal deformation to, to get off this, this singular locus. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that's possible? And would you expect the spectrum to become entirely discrete in that case, as you'd expect it from say, um, standard spectrum? Yes. Uh, so, uh, yes. So that's the general law that it becomes entirely discrete. I think there are various conflicting uh, ways people think about it, how exactly it becomes discrete. I, I actually wrote a paper on it and we found that if you do this first order conformal perturbation theory, then conformal weights would become complex and that like of this continuous sector, and that will give you one reason to throw it out. But I, I'm not totally sure whether that's the right way to think about it. But the general law is certainly that it should become, uh, you should throw out this continuous sector somehow. Uh, but it might be very hard to see that in like conformal perturbation theory in general. Um, yeah, so like a very rough thing that I can add, perhaps if you would, you can actually see, like if you would put for, for example, a little bit of RR flux in the theory, then you, you know on the wheelchair there's, there's some operator that turns on this RR flux. And you can see what this operator corresponds to in the symmetric orbifold. And roughly what it corresponds to is in a, another uh, like exponential perturbation like this one, but in the other direction. So you would add on top of this a, a perturbation like this. And then of course, if you have two like such exponential walls then you will get discrete spectrum and you're not getting continuous spectrum anymore. So that's a very rough idea how in the symmetric, in this, in this dual CFT picture, um, if you turn on some, some other like Raman Raman flux, um, how the spectrum becomes discrete. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, that's, then let's thank uh, Lorenz again for a very nice uh, talk. Thank you all. Yes, thanks for, for coming. And then let me stop. The